So we'll try this again. The first time we tried to do this random banter segment, it was so bad we decided to shoot it a second time, which is appropriate given what we saw out of the Nittany Lions last week. Sometimes it's tough to get up for these games, right? Correct. Very hard. Or we're just bad. <laughs> that goes without saying. But we're going to do our best to make this matchup against the Northwestern Wildcats mildly interesting. So everybody grab your pencil and your paper. It's the obligatory PSU pregame show. Everybody, to the obligatory PSU pregame show. We are coming to you from the fun basement of Champs downtown, as we are every week. We're enjoying our new trail beers. We got the uh, signature Broken Heels IPA here, of course, the Whiteout. Goon, enjoying that crisp lager aye, 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 aye. very much. We appreciate you being here with us as we follow the Nittany Lions through their 2022 season. I am your fake host, Chris Bucanani. We got the usual crew here with us. Mike the Mailman, beloved campus icon. Yes, we are 4-0, guys. 4-0. Yep, thanks. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. The scab back on the set while there Noble does his NFL thing. Keith Goon Conlon. How are you guys? I'm back again. Crossing the line. I uh, know. Crossing the line, you're exactly right. I would have. Former OnwardState.com managing editor Kevin Horn. Hello, Chris. Yeah, we're up in the Roadrunners today. Yep, UTSA. Like we're going to do a, new, a different college every week if I we can it. help it. And UTSA it's is my second favorite team. That's your second team. Yeah. Right. And joining us for the entire show today, we're happy to have him, the CEO of your Penn State Alumni Association, the largest dues-paying alumni yes. association in the world, Paul Clifford. It's an honor to be here with you guys. It's actually not. <laughs> and Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> so we bring Paul on the show at least once a year, and it still hasn't gotten him fired from the job, so now we're just going to have him for the whole show. And, 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 and good. Good luck to you, buddy. Just keep taking our chances. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I do always like to point out, Paul, that I always emphasize the dues-paying alumni association right. element. So well, <laughs> <laughs> because Notre Dame likes to claim they have the largest alumni association in the world, but everyone who graduates from Notre Dame gets automatically inducted into the alumni association. So you really don't have to do anything other than show up. Show up, graduate, yeah. right? Yeah. Not an easy feat from an institution I, yeah, like, fair, fair. like Notre Dame, and yet it's uh, just like you're the fake host, it's a fake narrative that they have out there <laughs> about um, who's the biggest and the best alumni association. And you know what, let them, let them stake their claim. It's, it's adorable. It's like people claiming national titles from the 20s. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The west of in yeah. western Pennsylvania. We're talking about you, Pittsburgh. Yep. <laughs> So clearly, we are not champing at the bit to review last week's defeat of the Central Michigan Chippewas. Maybe a little bit underwhelming from what people were expecting, especially given the performances versus Ohio and Auburn that preceded it. So let's just get a heat check. I'll start with the positive side of the table. Mike, the mailman, go. Oh, well, I think, um, like Goon or Brandon said last week, how there's a letdown after a big game like that. Hangover. And a hangover, that's what you call it. Yeah. And I think that, that was apparent yep. early. You know, Penn State may not be as good as we think they are. Uh, we'll have to see. Uh, I, but I don't think the Big Ten is as good as we think it is either. So I don't know. I think, uh, I think if they won, that's important. Mm -hmm. and we'll move on to the next game. That's what you got to do. I have a comment about that that I'll get to in a minute. But, Kev, what are you thinking after last week's game? Look, I mean, I, I still don't know what to make of this team, right? Because the, the strength of schedule is, is fairly abysmal despite having Auburn on it, right? They, they took them overtime to beat... Uh, uh, Missouri last week, and they should have. Missouri should have won in regulation, right? Purdue lost, uh, but it's all, there, there could not be any good teams at all this year, right? Like Alabama almost lost. George Kent State was taking Georgia into the fourth quarter. Oh, unbelievable striking distance. Maryland uh, was uh, had Michigan on the ropes. I mean, Clemson almost lost. I mean, maybe there just aren't any good teams, which I think is a good thing. Parity, I guess, would be the way to, to put it. But uh, look, it was a bad Sean Clifford game, despite not having any turnovers. You know, he's only had one turnover this year, which is kind of remarkable. Um, it was a bad Sean game, and a bad Sean game is, is bad. Um, and, you know, he, it's the only one he's had this year. Um, Nick Singleton, uh, 
underperformed compared to how he did down in Alabama uh, last or two weeks ago. Um, Katron Allen seemed to be the guy for Penn State because Nick Singleton was just getting stuffed by Central Michigan. So, Do you think this is a strategic plan by James to uh, use one running back type no, of thing? I mean, you know what I mean? Not they, wear one guy out? They gave Nick you know, the, the majority in the first quarter of, yeah. of the snaps, and it just wasn't happening. It wasn't getting it done, and they moved on. Yeah. But it's also true that Central Michigan could be the best team we played this year, which is kind of a crazy thing to say, given we had Auburn and, and, and Purdue already. But they could be the best team we played this year. It's a quality MAC team. Their quarterback's pretty good. If you look at the number of points they put up through the first three weeks of the season and then some of the crazy catches that their that receivers nice were making during that game, you saw that, you know, there are teams in the MAC now that can pull talent that allow them to hang for a while against even quality FBS programs, and that's what you saw. Uh, my takeaway, Goon, other than I, I, I guess I, I am most concerned out of all the things, I know people were a little underwhelmed by the performance. A lot of it to me just felt like a team that came out a little flat after an emotional high the week before and knew, they just knew they were good enough to beat the opponent without having to play their best game. And then they played like it all day. Yeah. They let up 14 points and then not another one after. Yeah. Not uncommon whatsoever. I mean, yeah, you said, I'm, I'm, really, I'm just not worried about it. The hangover not. aspect of it. It was such a huge emotional game last week uh, that going into this game and Central Michigan, I mean, you could see where there might even be a two or three week hangover type of uh, thing, but I'm glad we got it out of the way, to be honest with you. Yeah. I think it got out of the way right now. Mm -hmm. We've sure. been saying about James and all our different podcasts, TV shows, and uh, Booch is, is that he seems to be learning from a lot of mistakes he's made in his past. Yeah, and, agreed. And uh, I, I really think that getting this hangover, it, again, it, 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 did, it didn't surprise you, it didn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. I suspected, but I, I thought we would score more late to you know make it a blowout type of game. Because that doesn't even look like a blowout on paper, uh, but it looks like a whole home type of game, which was it, it was expected. Where do we go next week versus Northwestern? And you know, going into a bye week after that, I mean, he you know James has got to get these guys up and going big time because Northwestern has a reputation. It's like a Purdue. They, they sneak up and bite somebody one one team a year. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I don't yeah. want it to be us. So let's not be that. Yeah. yeah. Western's the embodiment of the facility does not equal wins, right? Like they're <laughs> yeah. abysmal. But, hey, let's get the company line from Paul Clifford here. No, look, I, I'll, I'll keep it, I'll keep it positive. <laughs> positive as always, right? I think there were a lot of good things to point to. Third consecutive game with a 100-yard rusher. Mm -hmm. um, opportunistic defense, right? We took advantage of the mistakes that, that we forced Central Michigan to make, um, and a lot of people got to play. So we're we're building that that depth that will undoubtedly um, help us later in the season as as we go on. So um, yeah, certainly I would have loved the the fifty to nothing blowout, but um, I'm not a I'm not a doomsdayer. I, and you look around the country as you mentioned, Kevin. The, the rest of college football. Uh, Georgia, Alabama, and Ohio State all seem to be pretty good. Although Georgia, I mean, just shockingly had trouble with Kent yeah, State. Yeah. But I, I, a lot of teams got nipped yeah. these last few weeks. Mm -hmm. And so there were some folks around me in the sands who were starting to grumble a little bit because they were expecting a blowout and being able to leave at right. the half. And they had to stick around till the end of the third quarter to be sure. And I said, hey, look, it is not a terrible thing to be not playing your best game against a scrappy opponent and still handle them pretty convincingly. convincingly shut them out for three straight quarters, hat tip to Audrey Snyder of The Athletic, a second straight game with four turnovers, the first time that's happened since the 2012 season. As you mentioned, Paul, a lot of guys got in, continue to build that depth. I'm really not concerned about too much. Honestly, the biggest thing I was worried about coming out of that game, something I saw that I do think could persist into the rest of the season, is place kicking. Yeah. You get an say. extra point blocked yeah. again, you miss a field goal. That's concerning a little bit. Paul's to me. daughter's a freshman at Penn State. I think she played soccer. Maybe she can be better than Jake Penninger. <laughs> she has eligibility. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could get uh, Chad Powers in uh, for a place kicking try Please stop tryout marketing Chad Powers. As well. Is there a Chad Powers segment? Segment's over. We got to go. Sell we'll be back. T shirts in the stands. Taking a shot up at the tailgate live with the stadium view. What a great spot. Hey everybody, just like we are doing every week here on Obligatory, we're gonna have some highlights from the Bloom White Players Show coming up for you right now. You can watch it live every Monday night at 6 p.m. Eastern on the social feeds of statecollege.com and Onward State. Here we go, I hope you enjoy. We are. So I'm Landon Tengwall from Annapolis, Maryland. Um, went to Good Council High School. 
Um, so it all started uh, eighth grade. Long time ago. <laughs> Long time ago. <laughs> uh, started eighth grade. I came to camp here uh, summer before going it before ninth grade. This is true. I uh, just freaked, the, I just freaked yeah. them out, by the way. <laughs> uh, so I, I had a good performance, and then uh, Coach Franklin, Coach Lime Grover, they ended up offering me a little afterwards. Um, At what then, age? I, was, uh, I think at the time I was 14. That's uh, that's the youngest yeah. I've ever heard of Penn State. That's nuts. <laughs> Do you know of any any? No, okay. no, definitely not. How big were you in the eighth grade? I was, I mean, I was a similar size, man. In the spring, uh, I was, I was about six five. I was about, two, I was two ninety at the time. Um, but eighth I, grade? Yeah, I was. It was well, the, the thing was, I was. I tell this story. I was a wide receiver, tight end in the in that fall of eighth grade. <laughs> but I was about, a, I was about a buck eighty. And then me and my dad, we decided that I needed to play offensive line. I was a little too slow. I didn't have the athleticism to play a uh, tight end. And uh, so put, you on, put a hundred on. Yeah, put about a hundred on. Maybe even more. It was a lot of lot of protein shakes, a lot of peanut butter and jelly. Yeah, I put a hundred on the wrong way. You did it the right way. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Penn State football is not quite Penn State football. We have an Italian middle linebacker. Unless we got a couple of guys with Italian last names on the roster, preferably at the linebacker spot. I, I just scanned down the roster, look for the names that end with a vowel, and then I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. all right, there we no. go. There we go. So, uh, Dominic, same deal as we started out with Landon. If you can just introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about your journey to Penn State. Uh, I'm Dominic DeLuca from the Northeastern PA area, Scranton Wilkes-Barre. Went to Wyoming Area High School, and uh, I'm a walk-on here at Penn State. So, uh, my senior year of high school, tore my ACL in the last game. Uh, COVID hit right after that, so recruiting was, uh, was a little rough. Coach Franklin gave me the walk-on spot before uh, before the season started my senior year, and uh, I just knew uh, I love this I love the campus. Been coming here forever, and knew I made the right choice coming here. I'm telling you, it's an unbelievable story. I remember getting a phone call like, "Dude, you got to come down there and see this kid. He is in eighth grade, and he is locking dudes out who are going in there and like top recruits. And they just may have recruits. been." You told, I was not one of them. Don't start oh, no, no, that. No, 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 no. You, you know the story, Landon, though. Landon didn't strap me up until years and years later. All right? That's the promise. But you tore Gross Matos, now a North Carolina Panther, second round draft pick. He was probably, what, a senior in high school at that time? Yeah, a junior? So. Yeah. It's ridiculous, man. So we didn't know my AC was torn actually until I had surgery. So the MRI oh, okay. didn't show anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wait, did you get one of those? We're just going to go in and check it. Yep. yep. And, and then it, you might wake up with a re. Exactly oh, what happened. So I, I had, I didn't I had one out. of them, but I didn't wake up with the whole torn up. I just, yeah. they just picked it in the meniscus. So, wow, that's bad. That's, I had no idea. Yep. Sorry to hear that, man. <laughs> now, you, was, pl you played a whole football game with a torn ACL. I think I just heard that. Yeah, I played the second half of my state championship game. State championship with a torn ACL. El Buche over here is all proud over here. El Buche. <laughs> <laughs> You were one of the most coveted offensive line recruits in your class. So pretty much anyone who's anyone, I'm sure, is calling. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose Penn State out of the field of suitors and just what, what, what made the Nittany Lions stand out against all the competition to have you as part of the team? Yeah, I'd say, uh, I mean, a big part with the coaches, uh, you know, that, the atmosphere that when you just come here, it's kind of just, it's just a little different than these other college campuses. Um, but, but really, it was it was the coaches. Um, they're just they're just you know they're almost, they're just like second dads. Honestly, a lot of them, even you know guys who recruit me back. I mean, obviously, Coach Franklin, Coach Sider was here at the time. Yeah. Uh, obviously, still I'm gonna say he was still he was still here back back when I was first getting recruited. Uh, a bunch of guys that had left. I was really close with Tyler Bowen at the time. A lot a lot of guys on the staff, and they just keep bringing in the same you know quality men. Not even yeah. just coaches, quality men as, as these coaches. Um, and, and they're just awesome dudes, and that's that's something that I, I said when I committed is, you know, I'm putting my faith my faith in Coach Franklin. You know, a lot of these assistant coaches, you know, it's college football; they move around all the time, they're always changing. But I just, you know, I put my, my faith in Coach Frank that he's, you know, he's always going to put the right guy in the in the right positions for us. You know, it, it, it's a fine line between pissing the players off, AKA yeah. going Johnny All American, like. 42,000 miles an hour like on like a Thursday afternoon and you're like, dude. Because everybody has them, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're talking then, to Johnny All-American this freshman year. You're, that's oh, the ironic part. This is, yeah. Was he that guy on Thursday the coaches are praising? That's why he's playing but, then, yeah, you got, but you all, you also had the WO behind your name. Yeah. You had that walk-on name and it was easier to get rid of a walk-on than easy. It's, it's a lot easier to boot a walk-on guy than a scholarship guy. So it sucks what you had to do that, but you did it and 
It needed to be done. Good job, man. Yeah. And it's paying off right now. Yeah, see you out there. Sure. Appreciate it. And uh, I give all that credit to it because going against the Aces, the tight end group, Tyler Warren, <laughs> Theo Johnson, <laughs> Brandon Strange, <No>. like, <laughs> I had to give them, make sure they were ready for the game. So I, I just took that upon me um, and it made me better. And I, I'm happy I took it that way. You're not small guys either. So no, a very, very <laughs> no. large task you had. Holding call this week. Yeah. First one, it's rough. <laughs> Brutal, right? Yeah, it's not a good feeling to look it's up at. It's the worst the, feeling uh, in the, the world. The no. time, it's the only time you ever hear an offensive lineman's name. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst. It's the absolute worst. He's got a shout out in, man. Why yeah, not? yeah. Why right. not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got, got me on the broadcast, probably. At least. It's NIL error, man. Yeah. All publicity is good publicity. Exactly. You know the rules. Oh, well, on, now dude. it's all about selling brand get. Oh, come on, oh, yeah. man. It's like that, dude. Any publicity is good. Oh, man. It's all good. Oh, man. No, man. It, it, it happens. I mean, yeah. and then the first one is always like, so I had one against Michigan, 94, with a touchdown call back. Oh, so okay. Kajana busts my chops one time and says he the one the Heisman had he had one more touchdown. That one hit hard twenty years later. Yeah, that's a that's a rough feeling. That's, still, a, that's, that's a little that's a little different. That's a little, that's a little different. different. <laughs> that's a little different. <laughs> was like, Damn man. First of all, it wasn't a hold. <laughs> it's a dagger. But if you're gonna get one, you get one. Yeah. So, oh, no, no, yeah. no ticky tack no. no doubt. No ticky tack stuff, so you yeah. take that first hit and you're like, all right, I'm ready to go. Exactly. Let's do it now. Yep. It knocks you like it knocks you straight, I swear. Yep. I wanna talk real quick. Again, <clears throat> I've seen a lot of walk-ons at Penn State. I had the pleasure of being Don DeLuca's teammate when he first came in, down there on that D squad his freshman year. Yep. And I knew immediately, I saw the look in Dom's eyes. Okay, I'm like, this kid is not afraid of anything. Talk about the mindset that it takes to go from being hurt and dealing with COVID from a walk-on spot to now seeing significant reps on the field. What did it take mentally to get to that point? Well, I knew even before even committing, I, I just needed my spot somewhere. And I, I know I'll, I'll trust myself, bet on the program and prove myself that I needed to do this and I, I wanted to play eventually. And I took that to heart and focused every day, put my head down, worked, and just tried to do the best every could. We do very well with walk-ons from the Scranton area. Absolutely. Walk-ons all the time, there's anywhere. No doubt about it. We have always had, have had great walk-ons. And I don't want to bring up Chad Powers, so I won't. So I won't. <laughs> but you just did. But so, I just did. So. Solo cup in my right hand. Matt McGloin, quarterback, uh, 2008 through 2012. Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, currently work for Sirius XM, ESPNU, Big Ten Radio. Also work for the Big Ten Network and uh, uh, currently do uh, Pater, which is a, a Penn State football show, and we're on, you know, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, we're on ESPN State College as well. <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I didn't really have many options. You know, it uh, obviously growing up two hours from Penn State, and you know, watching them every Saturday, you know, understanding the history, the tradition of, you know, playing at Penn State. It's obviously a school you always, one of the schools you always dreamed about playing for, and. You know, as you know, I wasn't a heavily recruited guy. I didn't have one Division One offer. Um, and then one day Penn State called, you know, and said, Matt, we want you to be preferred walk-on. And uh, I took that opportunity and ran with it. Yeah, I think there's a couple, you know, that certainly stand out. Um, you know, getting my, my first game at, real game action at Minnesota on the road, you know, unexpected in a way. And uh, being put into a game like that when the guy in front of you gets injured, that's never the way you want to earn your job or the way you want to get playing time. You know, you always want to feel like you're the best guy for the job and you're playing because, you know, you are better than everybody else. You've earned that position. You know, but at the same time, you always prepare like you're the starting quarterback. You're always prepared to play. First start against Michigan, right? That white out night game. Um, you know, Joe's 400th win, Joe's 409th win. You know, a lot of great memories stand out. Um, you know, Bill O'Brien's first win at home. Um, just uh, so lucky and so fortunate, again, to play for two great head coaches, but also to be a part of so many great games and, and so many memories that'll go on forever in Penn State football history. <laughs> uh, my first, so this, yeah, this is, I think I might have told this story before on my podcast, I'm not sure. Uh, one of my first ever games at Penn State, you know, yeah, preferred walk-on guy, 
you know, buried on the depth chart, fifth, sixth, seventh on the depth chart, whatever it may be, they like threw me this clipboard. And just busy work, I'm assuming. Hey Matt, just write down the plays, let us know, you know, keep chart all the plays. And like at the time you're thinking to yourself like, yeah, absolutely, you know, this is awesome. You know, this is a good little gig right here. I'm gonna learn these plays. I'm really gonna take pride, you know, in what I'm doing. Now I look back, that's what I'm like. I'm like, they just were trying to get me to stay busy or make me feel good about myself. Uh, but uh, I'm, so I'm walking, you know, I'm charting plays, walking up and down. I notice, I look and Joe's shoes untied. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, all right, like somebody's gotta see this, right? And now I'm watching him, he's walking up and down. I'm like, how does nobody see that this, this guy's shoe is untied? And I'm thinking to myself, like, he's gonna trip, he's gonna fall, this is a nationally televised game. Like this, like, this isn't gonna be good. It's so, like, finally, I'm pretty sure Joe didn't even know who I was at the time, right? In my first year there, he called me the kid for the coal, re the kid from the coal region for a while, and then he, then he called me Mac, you know, towards the end of my career. But uh, I just went up, I'm like, hey, uh, coach. And he looked at me, I'm like, your shoe's untied. Just like that, and he was like, I, I can't reach, reach, I can't reach down to tie it. And I was like, oh, all right, well, coach, I mean, do you want me to tie it for you? I can tie it for you. And he was like, all right, yeah. So I went down and now I'm tying his shoe. And as I'm tying his shoe, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, this is a nationally televised game here. I'm on the sideline. I'm tying Joe Paterno's shoe here. And I don't think anybody ever saw it. Solo cup in my right hand. Pig skin in my left. And it just feels so right, man. College football's bad. Yeah, we're waking up. Hey, welcome back everybody to the obligatory PSU pregame show. We're coming to you from Champs downtown, down here in the game room of the basement. Chris Bucanati with Keith Goon Conlin, Kevin Horn, Mike the Mailman, and Penn State Alumni Association CEO Paul Clifford. Great to be here. I, I, you're, you're such a convincing liar. Paul. So far, just, so far, so good. Yeah, That's so like, far, so say good. it that way, Appreciate right? Yeah. So, Paul, I was just hoping as we start this segment, we want to talk to you a little bit about what the Alumni Association is doing this football season. But right. introduce yourself to the audience, get everybody a little bit of your background, and, and what brought you here to Penn State. Yeah, I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, now in my seventh year here, back home uh, in Pennsylvania, a lifelong. Penn State fam, father's class of 72. Um, I was able to pick up a degree along the way from Penn State, class of 2020. Uh, and it just, you know, I've been doing this work all around the country from, from Yukon to Oregon, JMU and East Carolina, um, and some of my prior stops. But this, it just, it's different because it's my family's university. And so we have loved every single minute of being back here in Happy Valley. Very cool. And I know the Alumni Association is doing a lot of stuff around the football season, as you always do. Tell everybody if they're a member of the association or they want to get involved, what's going on this fall? Absolutely. A couple things of interest, right? We always try to support our student athletes. We do that when we go on the road with our Roar Tour 2022, where we have pep rallies at every away football game. Next stop is at the University of Michigan. Um, something that was born out of the out of the pandemic was we started what we call Football Letter Live, right? Members of the Alumni Association uh, for the past 70 plus years have been receiving the football letter from Ridge Riley to John Black and now John Petitnock serving as the editor of that. But we um, have added a weekly show, if you will, a weekly YouTube show uh, that during the pandemic helped keep Penn Staters connected to Penn State football and has now continued to it. Our niche is uh, focusing on our volunteers and how they support Penn State Athletics. And then we feature uh, what we were calling our Success with Honor segment, right? We feature a letterman who's out in the world doing some doing some great things. It's a, almost like a where are they now kind of segment and we get to feature the great work that they're doing in their professions and in their communities. 
You've had Letterman on the show who are out in the world doing great things, and you had Noble on as well, is my understanding. That, that's, exa yeah. that's exactly right. <laughs> they were hard up for guests. There's, there's, there's hits, and there, there's certainly misses. And so I'll let you, uh, I'll let you, I'll let you guys categorize This is what Noble. we do to him when, when he's on, Mr. Off doing the NFL game. Oh. I was okay, right, Paul? Oh, you were fantastic. Oh, yeah. Goon, Goon saved us. First. Goon, Goon saved us. Was that Chaffee uh, Fields once, too? What? I thought it was Chaffee Fields. You were Chaffee Fields, and then I we had... I was Goon one week, and then a couple weeks later, I was Chaffee Fields talking about making that catch against Miami. Yeah. Burn. Yeah, I mean, look, I we, had, we, had a guest, we had a guest cancel on yeah. us. We were thinking, who's sitting around doing nothing? And Goon oh. Cotton oh. came to oh. <laughs> 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 my immediately. So, he comes on the show, throwing Mikey. fireballs. Mikey, take care of this for me over here. Jeez. Giving you this platform to tell everyone about all the great benefits of the Penn State Alumni Association, wow. which you should absolutely join if you're not already. Where can people go to find out more information? Yeah, visit our website at alumni.psu.edu, and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. It's that simple. Go do it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I just wanna hear the fight song And you can check your phone, I ain't worried about that yeah. About to lose my voice for this third down sack Yeah, we're taking a shot up at the tailgate lot With a stadium view What a great spot, damn it, I've been waiting all week Welcome ways. back everybody, thanks for watching Still here at Champs Downtown, still enjoying our delicious new trail beers I know the whiteout is still a few weeks away for the Nittany Lions But you can enjoy a whiteout anytime you like With new trails, delicious, I mean truly excellent Whiteout Hazy IPA, highly recommend that wherever you get your craft beverages. W.R. Hickey here in Happy Valley. And since we've got the CEO of our alumni association, the largest dues-paying alumni association in the world, and just throw that out there, alumni.psu.edu. Paul, it's always a little happier in Happy Valley when Penn State's having a great season, yeah. as they undoubtedly are. And a lot of, I will remind everyone, there are a lot of other teams around the country that thought they were going to be in the position right. Penn State is right now, and they got nipped, oftentimes by some teams nobody expected them to lose to. So appreciate it. Appreciate 4-0. Uh, just from your perspective as somebody who's interacting with rank and file in Nittany Nation, what are you seeing out there enthusiasm-wise? What's it been like through these first few weeks of the season? A lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, certainly being 4-0 fuels that, right? And uh, they, you know, there's some teams around the country who would love to be in the position that we're in. You know, the, um, the current state of... A, a bunch of them paid a lot of money absolutely. Uh, <laughs> to try to be in this position. And nevertheless, those poor folks absolutely. down in Coral Gables yeah. or at Texas A&M. Yeah, the current state of college football is, is that if you, if you lose a game, uh, it almost, you know, it undoubtedly eliminates you from any opportunity to compete for the national championship until we get into, like, the 32-team playoff system. <laughs> that, is, that, is eventually, right, right. that is eventually coming um, down the unless road. Unless that game is the SEC championship game, then it just affects your seating. Exactly, yeah. but the Notre Dames, the Oregons, the Texas A&Ms would love to be 4-0 and right now. And so I think we should... We should appreciate that. We have Northwestern coming to town uh, this weekend. They just, uh, I don't know if it was an upset or if Miami of Ohio was just the better team on the field that day, but they come in licking some wounds from a, a really rough start uh, to their season. We get the bye week and then we'll, we'll see what this team is, right? Yeah. When, we, when we go to Michigan and have the opportunity to take on what will undoubtedly be a top five Michigan team. They announced that yet? That Rumor of being a noon game. Uh, I, as we are filming, we don't have it, yeah. but I, I am guessing it's going to be a nooner just because it is a Fox, Fox game, game for sure. Game. Yeah, yeah. And since uh, Paul brought up Michigan, I, I'm just curious. We'll talk about Northwestern in the next segment. Did the result versus Maryland, Terrapins hanging around versus Wolverines change your perspective on how good Michigan is or isn't? Sure. Yeah, to me it did. Yeah, they, they seem very beatable. Um, and they have a good quarterback in McCarthy. It seems like he's been settled for the job. But, yeah, they seem – what worries me more than Michigan, frankly, I mean, Michigan's probably the better team if you play them ten times. I bet I know what you're going to say. You know, I'm going to say Minnesota. Yeah. And you knew I was yeah. because they look phenomenal, and they kick the crap out of Sparty at their house. And so, of course, this is a Penn State, James Franklin coach team, so we will beat Michigan. We will become three or four. Spirits will be high, and then we'll go lose by 20 to Minnesota in the dumbest possible way. That's just how this works. That's what we signed up for is uh, being fans of this program. So, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly less worried about Michigan. 
<laughs> and really, I'm not worried about the rest of the Big Ten hardly at all. But Maryland could be a tough game. Obviously, Ohio State, they, they look phenomenal. But Minnesota is that sneaky team that I wish we didn't have this year from the West on our schedule. At least we got them at home. At least we got them at night. But, yeah, it's going to be a tough one. Is that the row of the boat team or what the guy? Yes. Uh, that's, yes. that's row of the boat guy. Uh, yeah. Yes. That's and so you guys, yeah. guys yeah. Kirk Chirac is revenge, too. It's yeah. Not, yeah. You, <laughs> Kevin glossed over it. But if uh, anyone stayed up late to watch that Ohio State-Wisconsin <laughs> game, oh, um, 31 points in 20 minutes of football, and, and the game was over, oh, yeah. uh, it was uh, – it, it was they're scary good, which again highlights the gilded path Minnesota has to Indianapolis now. Mm -hmm. Everybody else in that division stinks. Big Ten West is terrible. It's an embarrassment. That's a good point. They know that about that, but we don't know about. I mean, go back to what you asked about Michigan. We don't know what they are because they played so little. I mean, those first three games they played, is, I believe you were the one who said it was the worst non-conference schedule. Yeah, when Maryland and Michigan met, neither one of them had played a Power 5 no, opponent yet. Ridiculous. But the fact that we're talking about Minnesota and Michigan <laughs> highlights the fact that you can maybe overlook Northwestern. We'll talk about them on the other side of the break. Stay with us. Taking a shot up at the tailgate lot with a stadium view. What a great spot. Damn it, I've been waiting all week. Counting down the days till I'm back in my seat. Tim and Steve here from the Let's Talk Penn State podcast, here to give you a couple fun facts about Northwestern. Cue the fight song. For alumni, there's so many. Julia Louis-Dreyfus, George R. R. Martin, Jerry Springer, Megan Mullally, Mike Wilbon, Brent Musburger, the list goes on. Who didn't go to Northwestern? And why is it called Northwestern? Well, did you know, back in 1851, it was founded in what was called the Northwest Territory. That was Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, basically Big Ten states. It all makes so much sense now. How about our Citizens Bank game day buttons? This year is a great one. North Worcestern. <laughs> Very good. Uh, in the past, we've had Meowch, Wild Cants, Mild Cats. I love when this year's button is a good one. And did you know, purple, not a common school color, ECU, KSU, LSU, NYU, TCU, and Washington are others. How about that fight song? Good enough. Man. Go stay. Go Welcome back, everybody. It is that time of the show. The Nittany Lions are getting ready for their conference home opener. Because, of course, as we all know, if you're opening the Big Ten at Penn State, you're opening on the road, playing the Northwest and <laughs> Wildcats. We're here at Champs Downtown, and we're talking with our guests on the Blue and White Players Show about the game coming up. Nia's here with me, as always, and we've got redshirt freshman contributors each on one side of the football. We've got offensive lineman Landon Tegmall. Linebacker Dom DeLuca, appreciate both of you guys joining us. Absolutely, thank you for having thank us. Thank you for having yeah, us. Yeah, thanks guys. So, as I alluded to, you already got a chance to open up conference play to start the season versus Purdue. Then you play a few non-con games, and now you've got Northwestern coming in. I wondered if you could just start by commenting on what opening against a Big Ten opponent does to prepare you for the rest of the season. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we think it come out, uh, you know, it gives us good, good competition uh, right away, you know, going to an environment like Purdue, uh, you know, last year, Wisconsin, things like that. I think it kind of, you know, you come out of there with a W, it sets the tone for the season. Uh, so I think that's, that, that's big time, kind of getting the, getting the confidence up. I know, it, and Goon talks about this a lot, that the amount of practice time, especially over the summer, that you used to see in college football, like the head of Penn State when he played here, versus what we have now, not nearly as much. Do you like having to get thrown right into the fire versus playing maybe, maybe an opponent who's just not quite as uh, formidable as a Purdue type team to start the season? Well, Purdue was a great team to get my experience against and uh, learning from Suth, a great six year vet, teaching me the ways of uh, how to break down film and everything. It was, yeah. it was a good experience. So now that we're shifting our focus here to Northwestern coming in, both of you guys are, are really seeing your most significant playing time of your young Penn State careers. What's going through your head as you're getting ready to win up uh, you know, at home versus a Big Ten team? Yeah, no, it's exciting. Um, obviously, like you said, you know, we've you know, been a little battle tested, you know, traveled down to SEC, like you said, played Purdue. So uh, played, some, played some really good teams so far this season. Uh, you know, we're just excited to come out, the fans, you know, I think it's going to be, you know, when it's Big Ten play, you know, it's everybody, it's a little different feeling, everybody's a little more excited. Uh, so, you know, we're excited to come out, I, you know, I can't wait to play in front of Nitty Nation again, it's a, it's a, it's a great feeling. 
No, I'm going to pose that same question to you. Now, obviously, your road has been a little bit different. You go the walk-on path and earn your way onto the field. What's that experience going to be like opening up with your Big Ten opponent at home? Uh, it's going to be awesome just, like, uh, get the experience I have. And I'm, I'm blessed for this opportunity. And hopefully I'm making the most of it. And that's what I'm just trying to keep on doing. So both sides of the ball, let's talk about what the Wildcats bring to the table. In terms of their offense, what are you expecting out of Northwestern this week, Dominic? Uh, big, a lot of divide from what we saw uh, inside zone, and uh, still have more to break down on them. Still don't know much, but that's that's why I saw it today. So when you say divide, you talk about inside zone for the layman in the oh, audience, I'm sorry. including I myself. About it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of inside run mainly I see, and uh, a lot of perimeter passing as, as well. Yeah, it's, I think it's a misconception because of the style of offense that Northwestern has run. I mean, for for practically two decades now that they're not a run-first offense. Mm -hmm. I, I know when uh, Joe Moorhead was here, again, there was a perception that he was kind of more of a passing offense, yep. but it's it, it, it all starts with the run, and that's what Northwestern does well. They're very physical at the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. What are you expecting out of the Northwestern game? Like? Yeah, just like you said, you know, hard nose, they're physical guys, you know, uh, you know, coming downhill, things of that nature. Uh, you know, they, they, we just, you know, started breaking down the film the past couple of days. Uh, but, you know, they're looking, they're looking good. They're looking strong. What does that process look like when you're kind of breaking down film? You know, at what point does it translate into, okay, this is what type of scheme we're going to run. This is where, when we're going to attack it and how we're going to attack it. And how long does it normally take for you to feel comfortable with that? Yeah, you know, it all starts, uh, you know, kind of Sunday after you wrap up the, uh, the previous game. Uh, into Monday, that's kind of when the player-led things go on. We watch some film, start to break it down, uh, see tendencies, you know, what players like to do. You know, when are they bringing, you know, these blitzes, you know, exotic formations they bring up. Um, so that normally happens, uh, you know, earlier in the week. And then, you know, we kind of see those those uh, formations and blitzes and things of that nature in practice throughout the week kind of get us prepared. But the, the coaches do a great job of throwing everything at us and having us prepared for the game, really to make the game easier than practice. I think a really interesting thing about this year's Penn State team in particular is that we've got a really great balance of veteran, very veteran in some cases, leadership. <laughs> and uh, a, lot, a lot of young guys contributing on, on both sides of the ball, and you two are both great examples of that. So now that you've really had a, a pretty nice taste of what it's like playing in front of the crowd at Beaver Stadium, do you feel like you're starting to settle in a little bit more? Yeah, I feel like I'm feeling more comfortable in the game. And just everyone else, uh, you can it's noticeable playing a lot of people on defense and on offense. We talk about it a lot. Getting those reps is going to be very helpful in the long run. Were there some jitters the last couple of weeks? Be honest. I wouldn't say jitters, but it, <laughs> you nervous, Dom? <laughs> I was I was nervous for the first game a little bit, but after that, like it, it started to get easier. I felt like. What about you, Landon? I mean, first season as a as a starter. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, definitely you coming a little bit coming out of the tunnel. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little, it's uh, you know, it's a little, you get a little nerves, but uh, but it's honestly, it's one of the greatest feelings in the world. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't get to experience that. Even you know, even other college teams, you know, they just sure. don't, they just don't have the atmosphere we have here at Beaver Stadium. Um, so it's surreal, and I just you know, when we come out of the tunnel every single every single home game, I just try to take it all in because it is, it's a, uh, it's an amazing experience. Hi everybody, Mike the Mailman back again for week five of Trends to Treasure for the weekend of October 7th. First trend this week, we go to the Southeast Conference. We have Auburn at Georgia. Georgia has covered seven straight home games, so let's take the Georgia Bulldogs minus the points. For our second pick this week, we have the Ball State Cardinals at the Central Michigan Chippewas. Ball State is 7-0 in the last seven away games at Central Michigan. So the play here is to take the Ball State Cardinals. Our third trend this week is the Kentucky Wildcats hosting the South Carolina Gamecocks. Kentucky is 8-1 in the last nine games and 4-0 in the last home game, so the players take the Kentucky Wildcats. Now for our bonus play this week, we have the Philadelphia Eagles traveling out to Arizona to play the Cardinals. Philadelphia is 1-7 in the last eight games, 0-5 in the last five away games, so the play is the Arizona Cardinals. That's it for week five. I'm Mike the Mailman. We'll see you next weekend for another edition of Trends to Treasure. Bet with your head and not with your heart. Go get them. That's good. So this is, as it always is in our final oh, slot them. of the program, our random number generator segment, where we just randomly generate numbers. We're just gonna get, that's score predictions. Right. For, for our guest, Paul Clip. Thanks for sticking around for the whole show. By it's, the way, been a, it's been a lot of fun. I yeah. have nothing else to do. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Slash horns car tires. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so boys, 
Northwestern, after the first week, looked like they were potentially going to be that sort of formidable, scrappy, Pat Fitzgerald team that comes up and, if you're not careful, you get licked type team. And and that was entirely a mirage based on our lack of information about just how terrible (coughs) Nebraska actually is. Since then, Northwestern has done nothing but fall flat on their faces. So for the second straight week, Penn State playing at home against an opponent that everybody, the team included, I think, whether they would admit it or not, is just thinking, all right, we got to get through this. It's a necessary evil to get to the tough part of the schedule where we really figure out what kind of season this is going to be. That concern you, Gil? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I go back to the Central Michigan hangover game, and then this is the old classic trap game because you're worried about the Michigan game, but there's a bye week in between. It North feels like less of a trap so because less of the bye, right? It really is. Yeah. I think it's going to be, you know, if, if I'm James last week before Central Michigan going to the Northwestern game, let's just stay healthy. That's the bottom line. Mm-hmm. You just stay healthy, win yes. the game. I don't care if you win by one, win by 150. It doesn't matter. Get out of the game healthy. Get ready to go. Go into your bye week healthy. Get a couple good practices in. Give the guys a couple days off. And then head out to Michigan in two weeks. Absolutely no one is going to remember or care about any of the struggles we had against Central Michigan Nobody. if the team keeps winning. I, if, I mean, I wouldn't even call it a struggle. I mean, I, I, I completely expected that. I thought we would score more. And yeah. I thought that Central Michigan would also. I thought it was going to be a a lot higher scoring game, but I I did not have us covering that game, uh, I don't think. In my mind, I know I made a prediction last week, but I was... It's just randomly generated. It's just randomly generated, so I am a random guy, so... uh, (laughs) It all works. I mean, no one's going to remember this game. And then, you know, we talk on our TV show with the players about how... You know, there's going to be a game where we're not playing well and don't deserve the win. You know what I mean? Like we talk about, we, we had our Illinois game in 94 where... They were up 21 nothing. We were kicking the ball around. We were just so out of sorts. But we haven't had that game yet. And it wasn't yesterday. Central Michigan wasn't that, that, that bad game that's like, oh, my God, i, I got to worry about some, some stuff right now. So I'm okay with where we're at right now. I really am. Give me a score prediction. Penn State, Northwestern? Yeah, uh, I got 45-10. I mean, Northwestern is just so down right now. And, I, you know, you got a team down, keep them down. Their offense looks one-dimensional, and their defense looks bad. You know, one-dimensional, a one-dimensional offense. We've talked about this a lot. That it's you, you know, you're a college football team. You can shut down one thing. That's what makes us yeah. as an offense pretty damn good because we yeah. can run and pass right now. I mean, you can't beat that. And, you know, that, that, that's the that's the nuts and bolts of football. If you could do that offensively, you have the defense on their heels, not knowing if you're going to run or pass. Paul, mailman, I actually thought last week's game was a positive in one way. That after you dominate Auburn the way Penn State did on the road. You, it's a little bit of a struggle to look for things to really get kids to perk their ears up in film study afterwards. Right. You win comfortably, but maybe not as convincingly as you would hope against a team like Central Michigan. There was a lot to work on, especially mm. on the line of scrimmage. So now as you're going into another one of these games against a team you ought to be able to handle, I think there is plenty for the coaching staff to be able to harp on and, and really pound the drum with these guys about these are all the things you got to get cleaned up before you start playing a team like a Michigan or Minnesota who is going to be able to make you pay for your mistakes. I like, uh, well, if, if I'm Northwestern's coach, I'm throwing the ball over the middle every play. I mean, Penn State defense. We did not have an answer for those crossers all day. I know. I, I, I have it for a decade. Decade? <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I think, you know, like, you, like you said, Northwestern, very, I think they're very down. I think Penn State should win by 19. I'm mm-hmm. my 19. Kind of pessimistic. Well, score for you know, you're 19. Right. You're right. Uh, well, I, I think he picked 41 last week, so this I is an overcorrection in the opposite Did direction. Did I say going to score 41 or win by 41? You said by 41. Oh, well, I thought I said, oh. I, I think there was an unspoken competition between you and Horn about who could pick a wider margin. Oh, so, that's, I, you know, that's right. Yeah. So, anyway. That's right. Paul Clifford, randomly generate numbers. Look, I think um, exactly what you said. I think they go into the film room, they identify you know, the issues that they had, they get an opportunity to clean that up against Northwestern, going into the bye week, going into the gauntlet of our, of our season and of our, our schedule. Um, I think they get things cleaned up and we have a lot to cheer about in Beaver Stadium. Let's go with like 55 nothing. The shutout. Wow. Yeah. Calling the shutout. I am. Boy. Company I, man. 
We're, we're scoring butters is bread. <laughs> the double nickel, which double means nickel. we are going to have some deep, deep depth out on the field in that fourth yeah. quarter. A lot You're of people will play. Still not giving the Wildcats the garbage time TD. I love it. I you love might, it. You might need to field. suit up. You might get it. Oh, hey, you know what? We, have, we have two Cliffords already. We get a third one out there. there you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't say that. Oh, my God. Imagine that. Kevin. So... <laughs> I, I go back and forth on what I think I'm expecting this weekend from Penn State because I, I do think there's something to be said after you, you maybe don't dominate the line of scrimmage the way you were hoping to. You, you have some miscues on defense. They come out with their hair on fire. On the other hand, Boone, I, I, I do think this is another one of these games that you know maybe in their head the team understands they can sleepwalk through a little bit and, and, and still win convincingly and and like Lou Holtz said I hate to have to quote Lou Holtz but it but it's true you're dealing with 18 to 22 year olds so the volatility from week to week is a little crazy so I'm going back and forth on on what kind of a score I'm going to get I think I'm going to split the difference I think that Penn State is actually going to play a little bit cleaner than they did against the Chippewas I but so, I still don't think they're going to play their best game, and I think they're going to try to continue rotating guys in. So I have got the Nittany Lions winning 35 to 13. Who cares? It's randomly generated numbers. Enjoy the game. Enjoy the season. Drink new trail beer. We're back next week. If you want we my are. Pick, just tweet at me. Penn State. Yes. <laughs>